I had uh, put together a compendium, again, largely inspired by Bakhtiar and the Bush. And I was thinking of following that up with a second similarly style compendium, which would deal with uh, some aspects of dimitude uh, that, that Bakhtiar and the focus on Jews and Christians hadn't really dealt with, and then we were expanding largely to, to the Hindus and Zoroastrians, et cetera, et cetera. And while I was doing some research for that project, I came across um, an anti-Hindu polemic, uh, which was written uh, during the latter part of Akbar's reign, which was a period of, of, of progressivity uh, at, where Akbar essentially starts out as a pious jihadist and becomes almost like a Hindu Muslim syncretist, abolishes some of the worst aspects of, of Dimitud, at least temporarily, for the Hindus. Uh, and of course, this earns him the absolute revulsion of, of, the, of the Muslim uh, clerical class. And, and one uh, Sufi, by the way, uh, Sir Hindi, uh, writes uh, uh, a, a, a what's, what, what was largely an anti-Hindu polemical tract, and that part of it, a tract I, I, I can understand. But in that, in that anti-Hindu tract, from a man whose biography I researched and could find no evidence that he ever met a Jew in his life, he writes, whenever a Jew is killed, it is for the benefit of Islam. So this hardwired anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, uh, in, in Islam, um, it does not even require the presence of Jews. Uh, so, so to me, um, it's not at all uh, implausible, uh, and, and of course, given today's environment with the existence of Israel, which is just completely anathema to the Muslim community, um, it's not at all uh, um, difficult for me to see that, that even a tiny uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, community center in, 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 the, in the midst of this enormous city of Mumbai uh, could, could, be, could be targeted. I, I don't see any inconsistency with that. Um, the media's inability to report about that well, it is, is entirely consistent with the, immediate, the media's uh, see no Islam attitudes about everything. Sir, thank you. Um, sir, thank you for your question. The issue is no longer about Islam or Muslims. Taqiyya or any other deception. First of all, people downgrade it to the Shiaism and so on. In fact, the Quran is very clear in this. Inna Allah la yuakhidakum billahu fi imanikum. Allah will never hold you accountable in your futile oaths. In other words, a Muslim, when there is a case against a non-Muslim, if a non-Muslim has brought a case against a Muslim, and the Muslim is a witness, he can, under oath, say things for the benefit of Islam and the Muslim, and Allah will not hold him accountable. The Prophet said, to lay a lie is a major sin, and Allah will not hold you accountable under three three conditions. When you are a minority, when you are in espionage, when you are in a state of war. And a Muslim is always in a state of war with a kafir. <laughs> so, alhamdulillah, he is excused. Now, for sulh, when you are making peace, by making peace, you are playing with semantics. Peace does not mean making peace, only reconciling two people, no. Maintaining peace, to maintain peace, right now the West is involved in maintaining peace such as we say now the western academia oh islam is a peaceful religion well how did you get that one from where did you get it it was preached and were known and accepted in the world by peaceful means what about the islamic conquest and for to have islam here what happened to them oh well you know that was in the past but then we have the crusaders well wait a minute there was nothing to do about the crusaders so the real lie is being practiced by the Western media and the Western academia. Mani say, come with your woman. Tell them anything and everything you like. Allah will always close his ears and his eyes and will never pay attention. <laughs> so, Laqiyya hasn't got any... Sometimes we just shift it around to make it. As far as uh, my esteemed uh, colleague has answered, your other part of it. But of course, India is a country which because of its Hindu nature, Islam is to a degree controlled. But still, the Hindus have given 
and being submissive and subjugated to Islam throughout. The major thing was you pointed out did not come because of its ties with the Arab world, because of its economy, and uh, if India were to say the Jews have been killed, you know how many Indians would be sent packing from Malaysia, from the Gulf, from Saudi, from every part of the world, every corner? It's impossible. So the Indian government, in fact it was uh, Mrs. Gandhi uh, who ordered a judge, a court, to reverse his decision. And perhaps we can talk over that, you know, in the largest democracy in the world. So that's uh, Mrs. Gandhi. Thank you. Finally. My name is Hans Allegans. I am a professional blogger. <laughs> Put it that way that um, I pay for my internet. Uh, it's a lot of huge problems we heard about today and all the other days. And, uh, I would like to raise a question, what do we do about it? And uh, the headline is marketing. When we, like we have been on the internet in more than uh, 10 years, you will see that the increasing of Muslim pages, web pages, with a lot of uh, propaganda and uh, a lot of smooth talking and a lot of explanation, every time you search on Google, you will come into Islamic or Muslim pages. And <clears throat> the pages that uh, defends it or explains another uh, point of view are not near as many, they are very few. So I would like to ask the audience here, if you are on the site that would uh, like to uh, deny Geert Wilders to come into Denmark because you were afraid of uh, he could uh, make a riot or something like that just by showing up, or if you are uh, them that would like to see on a bus outside here, Jews are pigs and apes, and then the people find out where they come from. I mean, somebody, some information must we have. Thank you very much. What can we do? Very appropriate question. It isn't just one thing. First of all, Hans, you may be aware of the charter that we launched, the European Charter of Muslim Understanding in Strasbourg in 2006. You need to make that accessible, you know, and I think it is time we ask some very simple, very clear and pointed questions to the Muslim community. Islamic authorities in Denmark needs to be forced, or, or rather than forced, if I may correct myself, be confronted with clear proposals. And they must be signatory to it. So, that is one thing. For instance, does Islam declare all the days to be profane? Do you know the word profane? All the non-believers are profane, says the Quran. In Surah 9, verse 28, I think. What did it say? 28. They are profane. That is why you cannot enter Mecca. You have to be a Muslim. Now, Let's ask the Muslim community, can you declare that an issue of Fatwa that the Danes are not profane? Because you are in our country. You eat our bread. How are we profane to you? The Quran declares that all of you are kafirs. It's say, oh, that's only a religious term. So, no, 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 wait a second. It is not a religious term. Every Islamic doctrine has an implication. The application of an Islamic doctrine has a serious implication. What is the punishment of a kafir? What should be a Muslim's attitude towards a kafir? What should be done? Can you issue a fatwa and say all non-Muslims are not kafir, they are following the religion of their choice and Allah has given them the permission. And so has a right a Muslim, not only in Denmark but across the world. As a Danish Muslim, we require you to bound by the Danish constitution. Can they do that? They 
one do it. Now, in terms of declaring that the whole mankind is Muslim, of course, Islam does not recognize. They recognize there is an Islamic doctrine called Aqidat al Fitra. It is a doctrine of natural creation. Aqim al Din wa Allah, Fitratullah alati fatar al Nasu alayha. Surah 30, verse 30. Saying that Allah has created all mankind according to a fitrah, a natural. So the DNA of every human being is a Muslim. It is his parents who make him a non Muslim, his society, himself, he becomes a Jew, a Christian, a Kafir, a Buddhist, whatever. But all of you are born Muslims. You didn't know that, you see. But to a Muslim, you are all Muslims. We want to tell them, say, we are not Muslims, and you got it wrong. Can you teach in your mosques and in the Islamic schools in Denmark at least? And then Denmark should give a lead to Europe, to the European Union, and say this must be across Europe. We must draft articles, laws, and things like that. But if we begin with one or two issues and hold them accountable, then, and to hold them accountable, we must know what is our battle. What are we going to attack? Where we are we going to attack? And I would encourage the chairman of our gracious and illustrious chairman to steam chairman to contemplate on such issues in the free press society. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Kent Eichel again. I'm from the Swedish yeah, Democratic Party. Please, and, um, we have quite a few people who want to ask questions and that we require some answers. So please, would you keep it uh, brief? Sure. Uh, and um, I write about Islam and uh, lately also referring Islam to Christianity. And always an argument that I bring forward is the case of the Muslim Reformation to contrast that with the Christian Reformation. And I read, and I have a hard time finding sources about the Muslim Reformation, that when it happened, it happened twice, they retorted to the core message and became hardline, the Wahhabists came of the Muslim Reformation. And if you could, uh, I'd like to hear about the Muslim Reformation and also where I could find the information about it uh, somewhere in, in written text. Thanks. Well, thank you. I will take the directive from the chair and I will be very brief. Reformation in Islam is kufu, it's apostasy. Therefore, you cannot. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tarfa'u sawa suwatikum fawqa sawta al-nabi. O you who have believed, do not raise your voice against the voice of the Prophet. Surah Al-Hujarat, Surah 49, verse 1. Wa ma kanakum an tuzu Rasulullah. It was not for you to vex the Prophet of Allah. Surah 33, verse 53. You cannot reform what Allah has brought through his apostle. Anybody who tries to do it is a kafir. The Christian concept cannot be applied and the Christians did not reform the Bible. They reformed Catholicism. They reformed church tradition. The Reformation, they went back to the scriptures. To go back to the Prophet and to go back to the Quran, we are all going to sing. So, it is kufur. Your question, sir, entitles you to a death punishment. <laughs> My name is Kreutz Berenson. When Islam has defeated all other religions and there are no demons left, who then are supposed to feed the Muslims? <laughs> Well, Andrew, would you take it? Mrs. Martin, you know, the, the women, I know. <laughs> uh, look, this is this is uh, this is um, one of the uh, uh, I think plausible hypotheses laid out there as, as to why the stagnation occurred was was the was the decimation of, of the of the non-Muslim populations uh, and their. Um, 
uh, psychological, physical uh, uh, oppression, uh, which which uh, stagnated uh, the, the the growth of, of, of the Muslim empire culturally. Uh, so I I I I, I I think you that, don't would, that know. would happen again. You that don't know. Again. There are nobody. No, that would, that would happen again. So they would kill themselves. Well, it, but, but there's been internecine violence in Islam since the beginning. Uh, I mean, the, the, the so-called rightly guided caliphs were assassinating one another. Uh, their factions were, were engaged in civil war. Uh, um, of, of course, the Sunni Shiite, but I didn't get a chance to mention that, of course, is, is due to a renegade Jew. Uh, you know, so we, we were involved with that somehow. Um, no, but the, 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 uh, the, the, the so-called Islamic culture uh, absorbed so much of the conquered peoples um, and then stagnated. The concept about dhimmism is brought in and westernized, madam, in your view, in the terms that there is a democracy and Islam, when it would rule, there would be no zimmi and therefore we would be all equal. Inequality is an Islamic principle, not equality. Not only Muslims and non-Muslims, a non-Muslim is an unequal to a Muslim. A Muslim is an unequal to another Muslim. There is an Islamic society in regards a hierarchy. And it is in Surah 6, the last verse, maybe verse 165, it is the last verse anyway. خلائف he created you, made you inheritors of the earth, and he raised you one above another a degree. All Muslims are not equal. So that's the first thing. So they will be fair. Don't worry about that. Point number two is slavery an Islamic institution commanded by Allah. So it cannot be abrogated. It is being held back overt slavery. But covert slavery still exists in Islamic countries and women are in slavery. Mm -hmm. So are foreign children. So are foreign wives. So any Danish girl who are here, here who is in love with a Muslim think twice. There is slavery and servitude exist in Islam. You should ask the Muslim imams to issue a fatwa and say slavery is non-Islamic. And he must comply with the Danish constitution and say it has to be abrogated. Then I'll come back and answer your question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question to throw for you um, about the concept of blasphemy in uh, Islam. Um, I mean, what, what does it imply? We, we have a debate in Europe right now, and some countries, in fact, have proposed uh, stifling or broadening the concept of blasphemy, not only to protect uh, the Christian Church, but uh, all kinds of, uh, of sensibilities. What does this specifically mean when you phrase it within, uh, within Islam? And, and Patrick uh, said that, uh, that, that according to Islam, it's not the individual, but it's the community that insists on, on, on rights. And that also means protection, which, uh, if I should try to understand that, means that you do not believe in, in, in the rights of the individual, but in the rights of the community, which means that you do not have the concept of human rights as the right of the individual. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so according to Islam, you can insist on on protection of, of ideas, meaning that that would be you, your concept of uh, of, uh, of human rights. So, so what 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 what, in, what what does the concept of blasphemy mean uh, within Islam compared to to other kinds of uh, concepts of, uh, of blasphemy? Thank you. I can take any. With due respect, may I just correct you, sir? I think Patrick was addressing a different question in a different context. He was talking about, if I recollect correctly, Muslim community being a minority in a majority non-Muslim country. And that is where he brought the concept of a community, and that community with understanding that the Sharia courts are now operating in the West for a Muslim community. 
and therefore they have their. But the blasphemy laws, Islamic laws, are in practice for all of us. What does blasphemy mean? Blasphemy means that if you introduce blasphemy law, Islamic blasphemy laws, then the first thing, are you Dane? Are you Danish? Yes. <laughs> then the cartoonist must be put to death. <laughs> that is the first blasphemy law you will introduce in Dharma. That would mean that every single church will have to take down the cross. That would say because that is a blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> they blaspheme and apostatize to say Jesus, son of Mary, is Allah. They blaspheme and apostatize to say Allah is the three of a third. They did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. All this is blasphemy in Islam. It means no longer back to walking. Europe cannot, must not, and should never, ever, that is, in one word, let me not elaborate, it is surrender. And dare you or any of your men or your women surrender. <laughs> as long as I sit alive here, there is no going to be any surrender. I will have to lift up the soul against any man who would surrender. Blessing for a Muslim law to be introduced in Europe. You call yourself intellectuals and educationists. What a shame. Yeah. Oh, one comment. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, yeah. Well, well, I, mean, I think. I think uh, uh, the end, the the collective that's being uh, organized that that is waiting that that could uh, that implement. The, as far as you can see, it implements uh, blasphemy law in exactly the way, uh, ultimately, exactly the way you say and describe, uh, is the organization of the Islamic Conference. I mean, they have taken the cartoon issue and under the guise of, 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 of the Sharia and, and its dictates about blasphemy, they would like to see uh, the, the Sharia dictates with regard to the fame of uh, Muhammad uh, applied universally. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, th this is this is not this is not a question of of, um, of some local so-called radical imam demanding something in response to a local issue. This is global. It's the same reason that I asked you to just take a look at the at the Universal Declaration of Human uh, of Human Rights in Islam, the Cairo Declaration. They are openly stating now that, that, that the Sharia, and of course it's a core principle of Islam, the Sharia supersedes any other human rights instruments. Um, and so, again, going back to this, this uh, bastion of mythical tolerance, uh, Islamic Spain, uh, communities that, that engage in any form of blasphemy, if it was an individual, the communities were collectively punished. Mm. Uh, and that, that's another principle of, of blasphemy, is that it doesn't guarantee that an individual will be punished as a representative of, of, of himself. The whole community will be punished. Denmark was a perfect example of that. Danes, Danes were punished all over the world because they were felt to be collectively guilty for, for blasphemy. Um, but the OIC is laboring very aggressively to get their interpretation of blasphemy. Um, what, whatever misguided residuals are left over uh, in, in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of uh, blasphemy law, uh, which is really trivial now in, in, in Europe from its Christian past, uh, this, 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 this would be blasphemy law on steroids. Uh, I mean, it would, it, would, it would be beyond what, what you could imagine. That, this is a very important question. Let me just add one further thing. Blasphemy isn't just drawing Muhammad's face in any form. Blasphemy is just putting the Quran in standard. Blasphemy is denying Muhammad that he was the last prophet. Blasphemy is affirming your Christian faith. Blasphemy has variety of, in the Islamic jurisprudence, and I speak as a jurist now, have got a degrees and shades and colors. So, if blasphemy law was applied, and if the Muslims were given the right to punish <coughs> all Danish people, including the queen, be punished. Please, let us understand what we are talking about. This is a very serious issue. 
yes, over here, and then the lady in front of and then um, Fat Yor. Uh, Dr. Silman, I wonder if you would agree with me that there has come into anti-Semitic and uh, anti-Jewish feelings among the Muslims, a new element in the last few decades. Envy of the position of the Jews in the world. I remember a speech made by the then president of Malaysia and also head of the uh, organization of Islamic Conference, Mahathir, who in his concluding speech in an assembly on Muslim nations emphasized that here we have the Jews, 14, 15 million at the most, and here we are, the Muslims, one and a half billion. And look what they can achieve and what we cannot achieve, it seems. And then he enumerated the number of Nobel Prize takers and what have you and contrasted it very frankly with the lack of the like specimens in the Muslim civilization. Haven't you, in your research, come uh, to an increasing degree uh, to, the, uh, to observe this new element of envy, which almost amounts, I would say, to a sort of desperation? I think one should realize that uh, when we speak of the Islamic threat, we should also speak of the psychological sources that are this enormous feeling of inferiority. Yes, that's right. <coughs> Who would speak to that? Very briefly, um, thank you. إذا جدنا أشد الناس عداوة للذين آمنوا اليهود الذين أشرفوا. You will find the staunchest enemy, the most venomous, the most poisonous, the most absolutely abhorring enemies of those who have believed in the Muslims are the Jews. And those who associated with Allah, meaning also Christians, but they are second degree. The Jews come first. The hate of the Jews is Quranically inspired. It's not about a piece of land. It is Quranically inspired. And the Quran is saturated with the word Jews and my esteemed colleague follow them. Professor Batyor, in her presentation, made or in answering one of her questions, said something very profound. No prophet of Allah was a Jew. They were all Muslims because of the fitrah. So Moses was a Muslim. Ya qawmi in kuntum amantum fa'ala Allah tawakkalu wa kunu min al-Muslimin O you who have believed, if you have believed in Allah, he said to his people, then O my people, if you have believed, become, depend on Allah if you are Muslims. In Surah Tunis, Surah Tab, I think it's verse 84, probably, somewhere there. They were all Muslims. The temple that Solomon built was Islam. So the Islamification of the prophets, of the books, there is nothing called Judaism, which is all Islam. It's not just only envy, but the whole, the, com the question comes now. The associates of the Jews, and there is a plan. And there are organizations, just like Qaeda, there are organizations who are publishing these things, but they are targeting people, and governments, and nations. After the work of the Nazis during that time, which are the countries and societies that assisted the Jews? They must be punished. And you know who assisted them? Denmark was at the forefront of assisting the Jews. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think from a sociological perspective, uh, certain, certainly, you know, envy, envy, envy is a uh, is, is a 
is a uh, common trait, uh, you know, uh, in, in humanity. Um, so I, I, I think that that can contribute. But if you look, if you look at the um, at the full context of what Mahathir Muhammad said, uh, I mean, he he was invoking um, also uh, uh, the Muslim Prophet Muhammad's interactions with the Jews and suggesting, you know, that that's that's the appropriate solution, uh, crushing them and subjugating them uh, again. But no, I, I, I think that clearly there's a, there's there's, uh, there's a common uh, emotion trait of, of envy that plays a role too. Yeah, my name is Vicky Newsom. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Sir. You are just <laughs> I don't remember the name. Central. Yeah. Central. Now, someone here asked the question, is there a hope? I think this is a very, very sad question. And uh, because it is a declaration of submission. So I would go to the roots and I would ask, are we ready to survive or are we not? Because if we are not really sure about that, we can go on having uh, intellectual discussions, which I love very much, but we can all will also realize that we have to fight the problem right here. And I think that we shall have to re-establish our borders, we shall have to throw out those people who show the slightest sign of uh, gang crime, and uh, we shall have to withdraw our military to Denmark. Because uh, I think, let me repeat, I think we will have to fight them right here. That was more the nature of a comment, I think. Yeah. So, yes, so, it was. Um, yes, it was. I don't think it requires any answers unless you have uh, some. I think it is, uh, though it was in a stronger comment, uh, and I appreciate that. Hope is, must always begin with us. It is not what they will do to give me hope. But what is it that you are going to do? That is the real question today. And are we envious, as uh, these gracious gentlemen put it? If I were to tie it at the end, I may bring a comment in my rounding off comment and address these two issues. Thank you. Just, just one quick comment. Um, uh, it, 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 it seems to me is that the Danes have a proud culture, and uh, if, if, if you want to preserve that culture, um, maybe it's time to start talking about that and use that as a, as a rallying point uh, for um, uh, uh, understanding the threat that, uh, that Islam poses to, to, the, to the Danish culture. Um, I, 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 but I, we're, we're, we're no better. I don't think there's any uh, place in the West uh, which, which has begun to come to terms with what is at stake uh, in, in terms of art, culture, etc., etc. If, 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 the, if the Sharia continues to make inroads in all of our societies, I, I, I see the same thing happening um, you know, just at a much more inchoate level, but in the United States. So I, I think a lot of this begins with, do we value our, 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 our own cultures? And if we don't value our own cultures, uh, then I would say that I, I too would be hopeless if, if we don't value our own cultures. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I think that uh, uh, Professor Soromo already answered to my question. So I won't keep you long. You answer very well. The question was, do you think that uh, the hatred of the Muslims against the Jews is because the Jews have written the Bible, and the Muslim says that the Bible is the uh, Islamic history. It is not a, a piece of uh, land. They pretend that they, the Muslim pretend that uh, there was never a Jewish history there, nor a Christian history, because Jesus is a Muslim Jesus, and all the prophets and the king, the Hebrew kings, are Muslims. So Jews and Christians have no history and past in this land. 
So the fact that you have a, a, a call on the veracity of the Quran, because the, what the Quran says about the, um, the biblical uh, history is not at all, and Jesus is not at all what is written in, in the Bible. So the fact that we say that, uh, that we believe in the Bible uh, means already that we doubt that the Quran is the in inalterable word of Allah. Because it is a lie, because we know that the Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus of the Quran. That the Abraham of the Bible is not the uh, Islamic Abraham. So this was my, my question. It's a very important question and I don't think it has been fully answered. وما كان ابراهيم يهوديا ولا نصرانيا كان مسلما حنيفا. Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was an upright Muslim. Surah 3, verse 67. And all, as you said, all the prophets, everything were Muslims, and Solomon built an Islamic masjid, a temple, a mosque. Because of that, and the Christians and the Jews acknowledging and saying the three Abrahamic faith is a lie. Jesus said that a greater man after me will come, his name is Ahmed. Listen to him. So, according to Surah 61, verse 6, if that is the case, then we have ourselves damaged ourselves in acknowledging Islam and giving it an authority a false document, we have given it a credentials. So that is a one big problem. The second issue is obviously Jews coming back to the land. This land, in Islamic terms, is referred to as waqf. It's an endowment, and it's an Islamic property. And for the Jews now to own it, it is the most heinous crime, most heinous. So we are deceiving ourselves. You are absolutely right, Professor. Thank you. I will start with the Islam Credit Network. What the part of the organization is. Oh, yes, it's very much in line with what you're saying now. That, as we know, and you, Mrs. Yor, mentioned in the first part also, that it's very important to know that when we're talking about the uh, religious history of those three religions which we are talking about, there is nothing much to discuss seen from an Islamic point of view because the Quran has the truth and everything before that is fortification, considered as fortifications. So we can't talk about Jesus Christ, we can't talk about Abraham or Moses without knowing that there's an opposite picture of them which are incompatible and not mutually recognized in that discussion. So that discussion is some kind of void. Second, it's in the same line still on street points. History as such is discussed from two sides. There are two sides of Islamic view of the same history as we have a very long tradition of critically discussing in our part of the world, and there's no discussion there because there's an authorized version of that last 2,000 years of history seen from the Islamic point of view. Same applies to biblical criticism. Biblical criticism, actually, we have a history of some 250 years of biblical criticism in our part. There has been Quranic criticism. It was done by Europeans in the 18th and 19th century. And actually, and that's my point, it's more of a common than actually a Christian. And there has been a lot of work done on the European side, in particular the last 400 years, on Islamic tradition, Quran, Islamic history. And European has been deeply in love with the Islamic history. And from that point of view, tried to uh, built up an academic tradition which is very valuable. I would like to, like to call your attention to a translation of one of the most important books on that history of academic studies uh, made by Johannes Fuchs, a German scholar in 1955. It's on the Islamic Critical Network's website and discusses in detail and in very impressive detail that history starting with the 11th, 12th century ending in 1915. Please comment if you have anything to add. <laughs> Um, there, there, uh, 
uh, my friend and colleague uh, Ibn Warak is uh, trying to um, create some space for contemporary investigators who are uh, looking uh, at Islamic texts um, and foundational documents um, the same, with the same sort of Western uh, uh, style scholarship that, were, that was applied to, that's been applied to all other religions. Um, and so uh, the problem, though, is one of safety. I mean, people are literally taking, I mean, even, even with the most esoteric kinds of scholarship, uh, when it comes to critical examination of the origins of these texts, people take their lives in their hands. And again, until the academy is, is willing to come to grips with this, uh, with this, with this assault on, on the freedom of inquiry, um, we're going to be left with the progress that was made up until 1950. And any statistics about the killing of Christians, like the statistics you did about Jews? And the other question to Sam. The OIC has been very powerful since the Khartoum problem. Isn't it time now for us to make a similar organization so everybody against the Islamists can belong to and then will become a powerful front? Just very briefly, you, uh, uh, Baki Hor's book, The Decline of Eastern Christianity, uh, provides copious documentation of the uh, destruction uh, or, or stunting uh, of, of, uh, of the Christian communities uh, under Islam um, uh, since, since the advent of Islam. Uh, so that would be my best uh, recommendation to you in terms of, uh, of, of, of a source. Um, and uh, I, I think there are, there are a number of uh, Christian organizations today, including Patrick's, uh, which are chronicling what's taking place uh, currently. What is your opinion of President uh, Barack Hussein Obama's speech in Cairo in June? <laughs> In particular, the statement that Islam is a religion of peace. And secondly, will there ever be peace in the Middle East? Or are all efforts to that end due time? Mr. Chairman, by with your permission, first address the issue that uh, my esteemed colleague Sharif raised. I think he asked me a question. Um, in regard to OIC, an equal organization or an equivalent of it, I'm afraid when Europe was coming out of war and began to build itself, it went into a mode that was a home. But after the Palestinization of European Union, we have no hope. Because Europe has surrendered corporately. And therefore, NATO, look at it. Look at the United States. It is no longer time to do a big organization. It is time for like minded people to come together and actually germinate something. So, and I'm going to be very brief about that. And I think that that is appropriate. People like yourself, people like these. Free Press Society and others. See, why do you have even this one? Because the established offices and established organizations are no longer responding. They have surrendered. Uh, your question? Barack Obama. Hmm? Obama. 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 The Barack Obama. You should answer that too. Okay. Yeah, let the Americans speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would suggest for those uh, people who are curious about Barack Obama to simply read uh, his two, two, this young man, two autobiographies. Uh, it's very clear who he is. Um, he is uh, an adept of uh, Franz Fanon. I mean, I thought that went out, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that ridiculous uh, third worldist screed, but this is something that he believes in. 
Um, you know, I, I, I and he, he does have, he obviously he does have uh, an Islamic background. He was enrolled as a Muslim in an Indonesian school. But his real, his, his Islam for him, I think, is his third worldism. It's not necessarily his, you know, he's a pious Muslim or anything like that. He's nominally a Christian at some sort of lunatic uh, 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 church run by Reverend Wright, who, who sort of dabbled between the um, nation of Islam and, 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 and um, uh, black liberation theology. But it's, so the underlying thread there is really this kind of uh, third worldism. But you know, in, in much the same way, you know, Sylvia Haim is probably our greatest scholar of, of Arab nationalism. And she, in the end, saw Arab nationalism as sort of a form of fruits, like a medical term, uh, a, a, an expression of Islam. And so I think for Barack Obama, his, his Islam is, is sort of an expression of his third worldism. Uh, uh, but his, with regard to his Cairo speech, I think if you see it in that context, um, he, is, uh, he is going to blame what he sees as the residual colonial powers for all the evils that, uh, that we see present in the Islamic world, uh, which frankly, by any objective analysis, seem to come far more from their own indigenous uh, culture, beliefs, uh, uh, etc., Islam, uh, than they do from any of the leftover detritus of, of Western uh, colonization. But he doesn't see things quite that way. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, uh, he's really a hard leftist, uh, and I think that's much more his underlying uh, ideology uh, than Islam, per se. Mr. Chairman, it's very interesting and intriguing to see uh, a fellow panelist rise to patriotism and defend his <laughs> president, yes. instead of saying it out loud clearly that that was, you know, going under the defense of being third worldism and pirate that Barack Obama's statement, Islam, whatever he said about it in Cairo's speech, he followed his predecessor, Bush, who was equally wrong by declaring Islam as a religion of peace. It is not a job I agree. of an American president, whoever he may be, to say this is for peace and that's not for peace. When you say Islam is a religion of peace, does that mean your silence about Christian faith that it is a religion of war? Does that mean that the Jews are for war? Why do you single out Islam? I think those of you who are church people ought to write and question. So, regarding his speech in Cairo, he said to the poor Egyptians and to the poor Arabs and Muslim world, I'm so sorry for you. You can't come all the way to America. So I have come here to surrender. Will you accept my surrender? <laughs> I have abdicated. Would you now accept? That is my version of it. It is a very sad day that that's what happened. I may be permitted to comment. I entirely agree with your interpretation. I think it's even worse than that. If we can talk about that. That's right. Later. Absolutely. Do you um, want to offend my fellow panelists? Though. Absolutely not. No, no, no. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a proud American. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, penultimate question. We have one, well, there is one more there, and that would be the last one. Uh, my name is Nahar Kent. I would like to know uh, the word, what is the meaning of the word shirt? I can't uh, pronounce it in German. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you must explain that. No, he said, I would say, he said, shit. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, but that's what they talked about. I just overheard. <laughs> Fatima Malisi, she writes about it, and I think if I understood it uh, right, she mean, means that uh, it means as well, criticism and uh, curiosity and uh, fantasy. Am I right or? I'm sorry, we lost you. Which is fantasy? Yeah. Shirk. Or oh, Shirk is fantasy. <laughs> no, 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 go, go ahead. Shirk. Sure. 
إن الله يغفر الله will forgive any sin إلا أن يشرك به except a sin of association with him this is the most heinous sin in Islam so said Muhammad so says the Quran I want to take the reference it is Surah 4 verse 48 Surah 4 verse 116 shirk is associating with Allah and therefore to give partnership to Allah making any partnership with Allah that is very simple to show however in Islam the whole of Islam is nothing but shirk because Allah cannot breathe Allah himself cannot breathe without the permission of Muhammad the centrality of Islam is not Allah the centrality of Islam is Muhammad Everything in Islam, everything, the whole creation, the whole universe was created for the sake of Muhammad. <laughs> Allah Himself serves Muhammad. We have time and I'll take it to you, I'll prove it to you. These are all Quranic verses. Let me just give you two. Woman Yatiya Rasul Allah. Whosoever obeys the Apostle has obeyed Allah Himself. Surah 4, verse 18. So, obeying to want to obey Allah, you obey the Prophet. You don't want you obey anybody else apart from the Prophet, you have not obeyed Allah. That verse alone puts the whole humanity under a death sentence. Because not obeying the Prophet is a death sentence. So, that's why I said so treating the non Muslims or, uh, you know, treatment is just an imagination. Every verse in the Quran. إِنَّمَا الَّذِينَ يُبَايَعُونَكَ يُبَايَعُونَ اللَّهِ يَضَ اللَّهِ فَوْقَيْدِينَ Those who pledge fealty to you, Muhammad. You know the word fealty, madam? Fealty is an old English word which means allegiance, loyalty of mind, soul, body, spirit, every cell in you, every fiber in you, if you play, pays allegiance. It's a profound English word. Those who pledge their fealty to you, Muhammad, place their fealty to Allah Himself. Okay, Surah 48, verse 10. So, Shirk is Muhammad comes and he is associated with Allah. You will never see in a mosque Allah alone. It must be Allah and Muhammad. Their name must stand equal. It is Allah and His Apostle will judge. And in Surah 33, verse 36, very important verse, no man, believing man or a woman, can take any action, can has any option. No man, no believing man or a woman has any option in what Allah and His Apostle has decided. Not Allah alone, but Allah and His Apostle. Allah, the Apostle is a lawgiver. He is above the Quran, He is above everything. And therefore, they have no option. Your democracy gives option and freedom of choice. Islam says you have no option. No option. The only option is to obey Allah and His Apostle. Allah may be dead, we don't know. <laughs> and may I conclude by saying this that this gathering is a declaration of war so all of you by default are under a death sentence <laughs> تُخْتَعُ وَأَيْدِيهِمَا وَأَرْجُلِهِمَا مِنْ خِلَافُ وَذَلِكَ خِذْيًا لَهُمْ Surah 5 verse 33 Those who wage war against Allah and His Apostle spread corruption on earth their, their, their wages or their reward is they must be executed, death they must be crucified not a Roman crucifix an Islamic crucifix is different and their limbs must be chopped off on the opposite side or they must be exiled. What these activities, this organization is done today, is wage war against the law and his apostle, is spreading corruption on earth. So, 
Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> the Russians dreaded them, you see. And every single one of them, the Mahdiya in the Sudan was also a Sufi movement. So he's absolutely right in this Sufi movement. May I say to you that Sufi orders, the Turkish Sufi orders, which are now penetrating Europe and deeply, and people are becoming mystical and thinking that that is a wonderful thing, it is going to go and lead you back to Muhammad, to Ibn Arabi, and finally, the fold of Islam. They cannot be separated. Once that ideology denies the reality, the truth, and the freedom that God has given you, you mustn't dabble into it. May I say, in the final closing statement, I'm very grateful to be given this opportunity to come. You've been a wonderful crowd. You're just an, an outstanding audience. And I can't thank you enough. I want to thank on your behalf our gracious, esteemed, wonderful chairman. May you know the guidance and the peace of the Lord who 
who has created this whole universe. The Lord God of the Father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. May He shine upon you, guide you, protect you, and protect your nation and your loved ones. Thank you. Amen. Speakers, it's been a long day, and a really fruitful day. Um, I wish we'd known this was a war, declaration of war before we started this, but I'm afraid it's too late now, so we'd better carry on, and uh, we'll see each other again, I hope, some of us on Monday, uh, Monday night, uh, in next of Adelaide, and uh, look forward to other arrangements and other activities that we intend to carry out. But once again, thank you to the audience and thank you to our esteemed speakers. Thank you.